Good morning again. Everyone's doing all right this morning. I uh, appreciate again y'all having me and my family uh, who is now exiting. Must be something I said. It's not a good, uh, it's not a good start, is it? Uh, I told y'all you'd hear him. I was right. Uh, but uh, just we appreciate uh, that and inviting us to uh, stay after to, to eat. I hope we can, uh, depending on him. That's what I said. I said, well, he kind of we kind of follow his lead there, but I hope we can uh, do that because I'm so hungry I could ride a horse. Y'all, are, y'all are, we're on the right track. We're awake this morning. Uh, so I appreciate the guys uh, leading us in worship so far this morning, the men and women who taught our classes for the young folks. Uh, we appreciate that this morning. It's very encouraging. Come and see, and I appreciate the chance to get to meet some of y'all there in the, the foyer. Uh, hopefully get to meet the rest of you. At uh, some point, and then, of course, come back this evening uh, if you can stand it. Uh, I'll be speaking again this evening. We'll do a lesson this evening on a little bit of procrastination, but it'll be called Felix, Frogs, and Pharaoh, just to give you kind of an idea there using that alliteration. But this morning, when we talk about something that it's not really that much fun to talk about, uh, we don't enjoy talking about things that we're not good at. Uh, we don't enjoy talking about weaknesses. But that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're talking about weaknesses. Uh, kind of a broader topic there, but we're going to narrow in and how God reacts to that, what He does. So we're going to look at what God um, knows about Him, because you better believe it. He knows your weaknesses. He knows my weaknesses. He knows our weaknesses. We're going to see how He uses those weaknesses, God using them to His advantage, sometimes to our advantage, putting us to work, using things that we not necessarily uh, would think that we come right away, oh yeah, I can use that for this situation. We would maybe hide that about us, thinking that it is a perceived weakness, be it physical or something else. Um, and God using that, we have some examples there in our Bibles of that. And then finally, our last point would be to encourage us, because I think we just need encouragement in general, but I think especially in our weakness. I think we all would agree. Maybe we're on a mountaintop now, and we don't feel, we kind of feel bulletproof, so to speak, but there are times that we dip down into that valley where we absolutely need encouragement, and you pile on maybe a weakness on top of that, and we could definitely use that. So as I said, it's not something we like to talk about, um, but as we get going here, go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1, and we're going to be in verses 3 and 4. It's the very introduction here of the second epistle. By the way, uh, Old Bridge used to say the epistles were not the, wa- the wives of the apostles. They are the letters, right? It's like thinking Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. I'm sure you never heard that one? Ah, I kind of like that one. Second Corinthians, we'll do um, chapter 1. And again, this is, uh, as I said, the very beginning of his, his greeting. Again, it's penned here by Paul. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, it's a lot of comfort. Right? It's like walking into a mattress store. It's a lot of comfort. Right? It's everywhere. I mean, you can't really read that without almost getting tongue, tongue-tied a little bit. Comfort, comfort. The comfort of which we are comforted. Like, we don't necessarily talk like that, but that's a, that's a lot. So when things are repeated a lot, be it in the Bible or anywhere else, usually that's a, a flag of whatever color. Usually we'd say a red flag. Uh, pay attention. Like, this is something, if he's using this word this many times, something's going on. So we're going to ask that question again. Is it hard, or maybe we'll just say, is it fun to talk about things that we're not so good at? No. So I want to, fellas, like, when you took, say you're married now, talking to the married guys, first date with your wife, is that one of the first things you brought up? Said, hey, uh, thanks for coming on a date with me. I've got this list, and you did like this, and the list just fell to the ground of things that I'm really bad at, and I'd really like to share those with you right now. I'm a terrible listener. I, you know, no, we don't do that. Like, that's not something that we do. I mentioned um, what I'm not good at in class, math, um, so when I revisit that, I don't pick on my brother, who is the opposite of me. He's not a good speller. Um, you know, he can't spell the word apocalypse, but that's not the end of the world or anything. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll take it. We're getting a little bit better at that, a little quicker this morning. Uh, yeah, he's just, he, there's certain words that, I, that we both, like, no matter what, I have to have the autocorrect on. He's like, yeah, I just can't. I don't want people to know that. He doesn't want people to know that about him. I, we don't go around saying, hey, like I said, the first date, you're not like, hey, 
Uh, I'm really bad at this. Uh, we don't do that. We tend to try to hide, whether that's a good or a bad thing, right? We try to hide our faults. We don't want to advertise them. Uh, you know, so we just want to talk about the positives. Like when you're interviewed, that's not the first thing you bring up. Here's my resume, and here's four pages of things that I'm terrible at. Like We, we don't do that. We, we want to talk about things we're, we're strong at, or at least things we're, at the, at the very minimal, things we're neutral at. We don't enjoy talking, but they exist, do they not? Like, we all, let's be honest with ourselves. Someone's sitting there saying, no, not me. I'm full of strengths. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about that, but maybe we feel like that sometimes. But it, absolutely, everybody here has things that we're just not so good at, things that are weaknesses for us, things that we do not necessarily rise above in. We, are, um, we struggle with things that bring us down. But I'll ask, is there value in knowing your weakness? I think we all, maybe it takes a second to say, yeah, I mean, I, I, that, there definitely is value in it. You say, I'd rather just not know so that I can not think about it. But there is value. As a coach, like, I, I need to see and know what spots of the field, what positions, what areas our team is not performing well in. So I keep uh, decently advanced, like, statistic and metrics so I can see that and say, oh, we're, we're a little low here. Like, we, had a, we don't have as many sprints here. We need, we need to up the intensity. We need to have more sprints in this area. Like we need, we need to pass. We didn't, our pass completion is a little bit low. We need to pass a little bit more cleaner. We need to work on that in practice. Knowing weaknesses is a positive thing. Uh, these players that go like something like the NFL Combine, you know, they, they've got they're really good in like two or three areas, but you know, they tell them, hey, you, you need to get your your forty time down or your uh, your bench press up. Like they're, they're things they need to work on. Things that we would say, oh, that's not really a weakness, but to them in their craft, it might be considered one. It's good to know things that we're not so good at, even though we don't like to talk about them. So our first point is that there, he knows. God knows. So we say we like to hide it from someone, whether that be you know, uh, on our first date or our boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or whatever, or best friends, doesn't matter whoever. Uh, we can't hide it from God, and we know that. But maybe sometimes we need to be reminded of that. He knows your strengths, and again, I think more importantly, he knows our weaknesses. So let's go back to this verse. There's a lot of comforts there. We'll see. Uh, we have one comfort, two comfort, three... Uh, four and five. That's five comforts. Again, that's quite a lot um, tied into this one small area. And one of the biggest things we get out of this, uh, I believe, is that um, you see there in verse four, we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves were comforted. Meaning, I've helped you, as in God is helping us, comforting us. Now what are we to do with that that we've been provided with? To go to help others. It's a, it's a task, right? You, you've been given help. You've been helped in your weakness. We all have in our life in one way or another. Now we can use that to just stay where we are, maybe fall back into that weakness, or we can get better, and we can help someone else. Again, it's, I think it's a, it's a process there. You don't just wake up one morning and do it. But I think it is something uh, that he makes very, real, very clear here in saying that comfort others just as you've been comforted. Uh, we've all been that in that moment where we just needed that. Whether it's an arm around our shoulder, uh, literally a shoulder to cry on, uh, whether it's um, you know someone mowing our grass for us, uh, we're down, we're unable to. Uh, just any, any fill in the blank there, bringing food over, anything, a phone call, a card, anything. It's feel good to pass that on. Absolutely, it does to comfort those since you were comforted, to comfort those who need it, knowing how it felt to you and how much you needed it. So God knows our weaknesses. Uh, and it says they're in all our tribulations. So not just you know, compartmentalize it and say, I'm weak at, at this point. You know, he knows your whole life what you've struggled with. We say weaknesses, things that tempt you. A word we might use is one of our vices, like vices, things that, that, that bring us down. Like we all have weakness. So something that I may be terrible at, you may be really good at. Something that you're really good at, or something that I'm like really good at, you may struggle with. So maybe we need to hang out a little bit and try to balance each other out. All the tribulations, all right, everything, God knows. He knows. <clears throat> he knows strengths. As we said, this is important. He knows those weaknesses. But I believe we are tasked to help others um, when we can. So when we look at the, the first part of that, um, verse 3 there, it says, uh, the end, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. So we just said all tribulation, everything that we go through, all the trials. Well, he has all the comfort to go with it. 
And a verse that we're going to look at at the end talks about a way to, um, to look to him to, to bear it, to escape it. But here, he's offering for every tribulation, for all tribulation, he has an answer. For all tribulation, he has all comfort. For any tribulation, he has any comfort you could want. It's an A and B situation, if and then. If there's this, then I've got this. And he makes it very clear just in these two verses. So that's that he knows. He knows. Maybe we need to be reminded of that. He knows things we're good at. Man, does he know things we struggle with as well. So we'll move to the next point here. The fact that he uses our weakness. So mentioned uh, like with sports or whatever. Um, so in soccer, uh, many players are right-footed. There's a very, it's similar with, with, with the handedness. You know, you have less lefties. Um, soccer, you have less left-footed players. Um, but left-footed players in particular are notorious for only using their left foot. Uh, and I mean, like, aggressively only using it. So we have one of our players, we actually have like four left-footed players, uh, which is kind of odd, but she will just dribble the ball like nonstop here. And so if you tell her, hey, turn that way, it's this. With the left foot on the outside. Instead of just taking the right foot and going this, it's like doing a full 360 spin to do something. And then you put her on the right to play, and everything is pushed in this way. I'm never going to go that way. I'm always going to get it back on my left foot. I'm only going to go this way. I'm only going to go, th- I'm, I'm just going to keep going this way. So I've got to use that. And so that's what I did. I, like I said, I put her on the right. And so she cuts in on her left foot. And now she had the whole goal to aim at. So it's using that, weak, that weakness. But she'll tell you that too. It's a weakness. We, we changed it up a little bit. And then all of a sudden, you know, three goals in the playoffs where she only had one goal all year. And I'm like, hey, dummy, why didn't I do this earlier? Right? Why didn't I see that weakness, the thing that was bogging her down a little bit earlier? I could have used that. Now that's a... Again, a silly world example. But there's plenty of examples in our Bible where God does this, and and one of my favorites is with Gideon. Uh, We know his story, but at the beginning of his story, you know, he's he's up against it, we would say. The Midianites are after Israel. They've uh, put them under their heel, under their thumb, enslaved them. And uh, he's having to thresh wheat there in the wine press, like underground, trying to make bread, trying to hide. Uh, Angel of the Lord comes to him. God comes to him and says, look, you're a mighty man of valor, it says. Like that, that's not a phrase God just throws around. He doesn't just give out that phrase. It's a very rare, very distinguished title. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a powerful person we're talking about. And he was a very um, not confident man for a lot of his story. He worked up to that point where his, his switch kind of flipped at a certain point, but he's not there yet at the beginning. And he's like, who am I to do this, man? I can't save Israel. He says, I'm the weakest in my father's house, who was the weakest in his clan, who was the weakest in the, in the little country there, in the tribe, or in the, in the, I guess the country, not technically yet, of Israel. So you go Israel, down to Manasseh, it's a half tribe, and then his, his little family, he said, and I'm the weakest in my family. So you just keep going all the way down. Everyone would probably agreed with him. Technically, yes, Gideon, you are correct. That is a small tribe, is a country is enslaved right now. That's not too great. Your father's house, he's got other brothers and other people, and, and you're the youngest or you're the, you're the smallest or whatever else, and you have the least. And yeah, technically, that would be a pretty big weakness stacked on top of it. But we know what God does with him. He takes it. And he uses, again, a weakness kind of thing. He has that big army, what we consider big army, not necessarily compared to the Midianites. The Bible says numbered the sands of the sea. Uh, but he takes this um, 300 men, we know the story, and he goes out and, and he's able to defeat them, a perceived weak force. He's able to go and do that. And there's another judge. Judge is my favorite book, by the way. There's another judge, um, Ehud. We know Ehud. We mentioned the kind of lefty earlier. Uh, he's left-handed. And not that it was a weakness per se, but it was something that God used where you would be like, God's not going to use me for that. He put the dagger on this side, right? Because you have to draw like this. He got into the king's chambers, as you know. The king's name was Eglon. If your name's Eglon, you're probably going to be shaped like an egg. And we know he was. Like, that's just a terrible name. A, you don't see a bunch of little Eglons running around. It's a terrible name. And he know he was a big guy because Ehud was able to sneak into his room, into his chambers, with a, the dagger right here. Like, you're not going to let an enemy in there. But they just looked and they said, oh, he's, no, he doesn't have a sword here, so you're good. But it's because he drew it on this side because he was left-handed. He was able to go and assassinate the king and get out of there. Like, that's something God used, some kind of, maybe see, kind of weird little, little tiny weakness, at least physically, 
And he's able to use that to, to liberate Israel, two, two different people. Those are just two examples. Uh, David was similar too. So when David, they lined up, Samuel was like, okay, let's look at these brothers. Family of Jesse, right? These are uh, five-star recruits. And he's going, he's looking, he's like, oh, it's got to be that guy. Right? He's tall, good looking, you know, runs a 4-4. We've got to get him. He's got to be king. Which, by the way, that sounds a lot like Saul, right? Saul was incredibly tall. He was a good looking guy, right? A warrior, came from a rich family. We know his son, or his father, Kish, was um, wealthy. Like, we, we, we know that about him. Did he turn out to be such a great king? No. But he goes down the line, he says, The Lord looks here, right? It seems in Proverbs, what was the Proverbs verse we read? There's a way that seems right to a man, but where's its end? It's death. That seemed to be the right choice. We've got to go with this guy. This guy's got all the strengths, man. I'm just looking at him. No, we, we go over here. Well, that's the young son. No, he's, 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 just, he's still growing up. He's younger. He's shorter. You know, whatever else. It's perceived weakness. But actually, we know he was pretty strong even back then. Killing a, uh, you know, the lion and the bear as a shepherd. Of course, going on to fight the, the, the giant. He was a little bit older maybe than we think he was. But compared to his brother there, he was perceived weaker. Than that. And Samuel just, that was through Samuel's eyes, you know, God fearing man. God used that to become king of Israel, the most well known king. He's, you know, the star of David, still in the, it's a different country now, but the Israeli flag today, you know, it's not the same one, but uh, it's still a big deal. A man after God's own heart. You can't really read through any of the Psalms on any pages without running across a Psalm of David. God used this man whose brothers were deemed a little bit stronger, or a little bit more pleasing to the eye, necessarily, with their height and their strength. But he used that weakness, or at least the perceived weakness. I want to turn to 2 Corinthians. Uh, let's do uh, chapter 12 and verse 10. Paul here has come to a level uh, of acceptance and strength with his weaknesses. In verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now that is one of the most backward-sounding verses. If you just took that out, imagine, imagine like Nike having that as an advert. Nike, when you're weak, then you're strong. You're not going to sell any shoes doing that. Like that doesn't even make sense. Like that is not a human way to think. Just as much as Jesus kind of challenged in his Sermon on the Mount, challenged the way the human mind thought, pray for your enemies. No, they were occupied by Rome at that time. They don't want to pray for them. He said, actually, if they get you to go one mile for them, which was the legal requirement, go two. He's challenging, revolutionizing the way they were thinking. And this is kind of a similar way to do that. He says, when I am weak, when we're weak, we're weak. That's what, that's what I want to say. But when I am weak, then I am weak. That's what, that's what, that's what the book of, of me would say. In fact, we went on a, um, a vacation in the middle of May to Vermont. Gorgeous. On the plane over there, I started feeling not so great. You might want to know the story going, not COVID. Uh, but it's, it's, I, I don't know what I had, some kind of a test of negative COVID. I had some terrible virus. I, could, I couldn't even put my socks on. I couldn't put my socks on. It was awful. It was terrible. So I do recommend Vermont, but do not go when you are sick. I do not recommend that. It is not as fun. Uh, Emily had to play, like, had to nurse me to health that when we were there. It was not. Great. Uh, I was feeling very weak. In my weakness, I was weak. <laughs> Couldn't really go on the hikes. Uh, I was just, uh, I, was, I was pretty miserable. But when I was weak, man, I was feeling weak. I wasn't like, yeah, I'm actually strong. I was like, no, I feel terrible. I'm really weak. Paul has got to the point mentally where he could take those things as they were happening. You know, and again, this is the level of spiritual strength and maturity. You know, it's not that he didn't make mistakes ever, because he definitely did, but to get to that level. Now, we may not in real time think that as it's happening to us, we're not, I'm going to turn this into a positive. We may have to step back. And get, but to get to this point is, is probably our ultimate goal. I mean, it probably should be, shouldn't it? As Christians, as New Testament Christians, to take pleasure in infirmities and reproach and needs for persecutions and distresses. Again, not for his sake, but for Christ's sake. Doing it for Christ. And we know Paul and through plenty of his hardships when he was out on his missionary journey, shipwreck, snake bit, you know, stone, being beaten, all that kind of stuff. He did these things for Christ. And he ends it, that's just such a strong statement. For when I am weak, 
I'm strong. I mean, that is such a backwards, almost, well, it's an oxymoron, like it really is. Uh, very anti-human thought as far as a physical uh, process of our brain goes. But he really turns out on its head and says, in my weakness, I'm actually strong. It's like the guy who, in an interview, tries to be clever. And there's like, well, what do you have any, uh, what are your weaknesses? The guy says, well, I work too hard. I'm too good at my job. You know, that's not that. That's silly. And that's, that's just somebody trying to score points. And he's probably not going to get the job. Paul's being extremely, laying bare his thoughts and his soul. And he says, when I feel the weakest, you know, I know that I'm doing it for Christ. And that gives me strength. Uh, and I think that was God there using Paul. And Paul using his own weakness to overcome some things. Uh, well, quite a few things, really. So our last point here, so we had, he knows our weaknesses, and you better believe he does. He knows everything about us. You know he's going to know our faults. So he uses those weaknesses. So again, you know, they're not to be necessarily hidden. We can work on them, work on them. Those weaknesses can become strengths over time, things that we work on. So I mentioned that player. I've challenged her already this year. Hey, use that right foot. Get that right foot out there. Use it, use it. Control the ball, pass the ball with it, warm up with it, juggle with it, get used to it. Same with basketball, dribble with the same hand, go on the side, only go right, only go left. Use both. Work on it. Turn that weakness into a strength. And finally, this morning, we'll see that he encourages us in our weakness. And, and don't we need it? I mean, we absolutely need it. Uh, we encourage, hopefully, each other into that. And we're told to do that, to comfort each other with the comfort that we have been comforted with, using all our comforts there. But having God being that encourager and knowing because we're going to let each other down sometimes. That's just how it goes. Because we're humans. And we're not always going to live up to that standard. No one's perfect. But God certainly is. And He encourages us in our weakness. An example of Him encouraging someone with this is, is Moses. Moses, if you remember, when he was first kind of called to go into, um, and by God to kind of go and, and be the spokesperson for Israel, uh, the Hebrews there to Egypt, if you remember, he was kind of afraid of something. He didn't like speaking. Uh, so who did he get? To, who did God get to go with him? Aaron, who happens to be his brother. Uh, that's a pretty big encouragement. Hey, I know you're scared about this, um, but I'm going to have someone go with you. And by the way, you know him pretty good. It's your brother, and we know what Aaron would go on to do. Aaron had a lot of good things about him. Aaron had several not so great things about him. He felt the temptation. He kind of was easily swayed by the crowd. He had faults, but in this case, he was an encouragement there for Moses. I know I don't like to really do, you know, I like to, when I go on runs and stuff, I like to go with friends. A guy that I've been running with, he's a preacher at Sherrod Avenue, Justin Pinnell. Like, I get encouraged when him and I, when he goes with me to run, it's an encouragement. You know, he is an encouragement to me, and I try to be one to him, too, to, to keep going. Yeah, we got a couple more miles to go. No, we, we can do it. We can do it. Like, I'd rather just stop. No, we, we, we got it. I want to go back to the car, he said one time. He thought we were lost on a trail. And it only took two or three wrong turns. It wasn't that big of a deal. Add a couple more miles on to the end of it. But we got back. We made it. I said, we're going to be on an episode of like uh, Discovery Channel, like Lost in the Woods or something like that. But no, with GPS, it's kind of hard to get lost. But like we encourage one another. You better believe God is, is able to encourage us as well. And he gave Moses that encouragement by sending Aaron with him. I'm going to go to, uh, we're in 2 Corinthians. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 10. This is kind of the um, last big verse we're going to talk about this morning. So he knows the weaknesses, he uses them, and then he encourages us in them. And in this verse it says, No temptation has over overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with temptation will also make the way of escape. You may be able to bear it. Now I can't, the way of escape makes me think like uh, Indiana Jones style. You know, when he pulls the thing off the pillar and comes and he's like looking around and there's a one way to get out of there and he's got to get out of there because that, that big boulder's coming it's going to crush him and the theme song comes in and you know he uses the whip to I mean how cool is that he found a way of escape to get out he gets out when we read this verse we see that part we see the way of escape and we okay yeah that sounds good but we I think we maybe focus on we may be able to bear it so I think about like a weightlifter you just keep adding weight 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 he's got it back here resting on his back or like a back squat or something, and you just keep adding, 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 adding. It's like, that's what we see. And we kind of look and say, God's looking at it saying, 
you're going to be okay. I'm just going to keep adding things, but it's going to be okay. And I think maybe we focus more on that than the way of escape. Uh, so bear with me here. We're getting to the point. Um, but I, I, wrote, I had a bunch of stuff I wrote about this recently because I just felt maybe we don't see that as much. So we're like, oh yeah, that person, you're going to be okay. Like, trust me, you can bear it. Guys, sometimes, what's the best way to, to fight a temptation? Is it to stand your ground and fight? Or is it to run the other way? Ask Joseph with Potiphar's wife. What did he do? He said he got out of there. He got out of there. There's a time to stand there and just fight, fight. There's a time to, to remove yourself from a situation, is it not? That is a way, an effective way to fight a temptation, to leave, to, to remove it, to get out of there. A way of escape. Now, the way of escape could be patience and endurance and just, just bearing with it. Right? It's like Paul's thorn of the flesh. Like just, Hey, I've learned to accept it. But another way, man, is to get out of there. Whether that's up here, whether that's physically. like to, to remove yourself from that situation. And I mentioned Joseph. Talk about the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness. Um, you ever seen a bulletproof vest with just the front? I, I wouldn't want that. I'd want it all the way, you know, I'd want it all the way around. So I can, when I'm going this way, I'm still protected. Like There's a reason for that. Okay, there's a reason. I think that's part of what he's saying here, to remove ourselves from that. And I think one of the ways we can do that is by knowing our weakness. Knowing the things we're not good at. Say, in this situation, I know I'm going to be tempted to a point where I may make a decision I'm going to regret. I'm going to remove myself from that situation. You've done that. God has provided you with that way of escape, and you have found it, and you have taken it. Like Indiana Jones style, you've used your whip to do that, and you're flipping over, and, and, you're, and you're free. You're good. You're out of there. You've done that. Um, I think that's a very powerful verse there. That God will provide that. And it should be an encouragement, as we've said. God encourages in our weakness. Um, this says there, no temptation has overcome you except it's just common to man. Now, I don't, we don't feel like that when that's happening, especially in the case of maybe something that, uh, a tragic loss, a grief in that mountain. You were on it for a while, but man, you just feel like you're buried under that mountain. And you're like, this is common to man? You, don't feel, you feel very isolated. I mean, Ecclesiastes tells us there's nothing new under the sun. Sometimes that's hard to believe and, and when we're in that exact moment. Maybe we can step back later. But in that moment, our weakness is the only thing we see. And no matter who encourages us, we we'll just kind of say thanks and shake, you know, nod our, our head or shake the hand or give them a hug. But it's, it's hard to have those feelings at that moment. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But God encourages us in that. Take a step back. Again, I don't think Paul just woke up and just had this kind of determination where he says, in my weakness, I'm strong. It's a process, but it's a process worth committing to. And I think it will help us uh, in our Christian life. So as we said in the first part, we can help each other. Now, not just ourselves. We can also help someone else who may be in a similar situation, or if it's not a similar situation, help them prepare for one day they may get there. You say, hey, you went through this before. What did you do to get through it? How did you process it? Well, that person may say, I'm still processing it, brother, but I can, I can tell you what I did to get to where I am now. And I think that's plenty helpful and definitely worth doing. So we're going to end in Hebrews 4. Um, this should be kind of a familiar verse with us uh, for us this morning. It says, uh, Hebrews 4 and 14, Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So we do not have someone that goes on our behalf as a, as a lawyer in the courtroom. We don't have somebody like that who does not understand us. That's the whole point of him coming here, I believe, specifically to, to say that, like, okay, uh, you say you worship this God and this, we have the Lord's Supper, but that guy doesn't know how you're feeling. Well, we can say he absolutely does because he was a man tempted in all points as we are but without sin. Now, he was here. He got hungry. Right? He's got a stomach ache. You know, fill in the blank, whatever you want to say. He fell down and skinned his knee. You know, he, got, he was hot. He got cold. Like He was a human in all ways. He knows our weaknesses because he suffered through them as a human. That's who we want on our team. Like That's who we want on our side in the courtroom. It's a lawyer that knows what you're going through, like that knows the details, knows it ends it out, that can defend you honestly and genuinely, like with emotion that is real, it's not fake. That is Jesus Christ. 
He's different than other high priests, especially in the Old Testament. Okay? Because they had to also offer sacrifices for themselves. Because they were, they were sinners too, weren't they? Yeah, so they, they were sinners. So you had a sinner offering sacrifices for you. So a sinner offering, sacrifice, offering sacrifices for another sinner. This is the next level here. You have a high priest, never sinned. Going in on our behalf. Talk about purity there. Talk about what we aspire to be like. Carry the name of Christ. Uh, I can't think of a better analogy than what's used here is our high priest, someone who's walked the walk that we've walked in, who's lived as a human. And that's what we said at the Lord's Supper. That's, that's who we're honoring there. It's who we're remembering. We have there in the front of the table, this dude in remembrance of me. That's, that's that high priest that we're, that we're talking about there. So a quick recap this morning. We looked at our weaknesses. That God definitely knows them. And He's going to use them. You better believe you will one way or the other. And finally, like we need encouragement in that, whether it's person to person, brother and sister to each other, brother to brother, sister to brother, with all, all the combos you want to put in there, and God directly to us, and hopefully us spreading the comfort which we were comforted to help one another. Uh, so this high priest we talked about here, uh, that's who we want people to come to this morning. If you made that decision in your life, if you have been a Christian, and you've been washed by His blood, and you just feel... Uh, need to be reconnected with the congregation, with the church. Um, we want you to, to be able to do that with any kind of need. If you request prayers of any kind. Uh, now, if you are not a Christian, you have not been washed by His blood. This high priest has been through the things that you're going through. He's been tempted in all points. He's been there. He's done that. And you're surrounded by people who, uh, as the Bible does tell us, the angels will rejoice in heaven. You better believe the brothers and sisters here will rejoice. You get all kinds of hugs and kisses and everything else, won't you? Like that, that will happen. I guarantee you that. But it's a decision you have to make for yourself. We sing a song oftentimes called Only a Step, and that really is all it takes. And by the way, as I was little, I always used to think the invitation song was like the only time you could do that. And obviously that's not the case. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. I know there are members here, brothers and sisters, you call any time and they, they will talk to you about it. Something on your mind.